Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Real Talk. I am excited to have my next guest. We have had so many challenges <laughs> with me in particular, okay, from mm -hmm. kids getting sick to a number of things. And so I'm so excited to have Terry here with me today. She is a published author, among other things that she uh, does in the world. But before we get into some great conversation, I want to give her the opportunity to introduce herself. So good morning, Terry. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm so happy to be here. It doesn't matter that it took us a while to connect. It's just all good. I um, I just moved back to California. I spent half the year in Idaho and half the year in California. Oh. So I'm just getting settled back into this place. My husband manages a fly fishing shop in Idaho, or sorry, oh. lodge, fly fishing lodge in Idaho. So we have this crazy back and forth thing. Um, yeah, and I, I did publish my book in 2020, which a lot of people did during the pandemic. And if I had it, you know, I had it going on well before then, but I guess when that happened, everybody thought, oh, I think I'll write a book. So I'm passionate about the words we choose. That's the title of the words we choose, your guide to how and why words matter. And to be honest, that people ask me a lot, like, how did you come to this Mm -hmm. to writing this book, right? And it's a combination of my leadership experience in hospitality, and then I segued into healthcare. And in both of those mm -hmm. environments, I had a true sensitivity to how we spoke to people, whether it was somebody vulnerable in a hospital bed or mm -hmm. a loved one at their side, or it was somebody checking in for the vacation of their lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. I had a sensitivity to how we, um, the words that we chose, so. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> yeah, you know, and so for me, I think, you know, words do matter. And I've learned that on my own journey of overcoming 13 years of depression and three hospitalizations. But for people that are watching, explain to them how much power words have, because some people, it's just like cliche, we talk about it, but what does that really mean? Yeah, well, here's the thing. First, I believe it's Starts with the words we choose for ourselves, so that's our, our internal narrative, and I call that now our personal podcast, right? So you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're you do a podcast, you listen to podcasts. We have our headsets on listening. Well, here's the deal: we're listening to that internal one twenty four seven. Sometimes mm -hmm. at three o'clock in the morning, it wakes us up and says, "Hey, Terry, why do you believe you can do that?" And so it's the it's the words we're choosing for ourselves, and sometimes mm -hmm. those words have been influenced by a parent, a teacher, somewhere along the way, which is why when you're speaking to, to younger people, to kids, it's so important to choose those words wisely and to make, ensure that those words are uplifting, motivating, inspiring, as opposed to minimizing, limiting, you know, and, and diminishing. And so, so what happens is as we grow and as we mature, we're still listening to those words we're still mm -hmm. believing them. And so mm -hmm. that's step one is to replace them with ones that are uplift, uplifting and inspiring internally for ourselves before we even endeavor to go out and do the same for others. I, <clears throat> I love that. And, you know, that so resonates because people look at your life a lot of times and see, you know, oh, she's a published author, you know, looking at your life and what you're doing and, you know, they create their own dialogue without even knowing what's going on or, you know, they begin to minimize their own value or worth in comparison to something that you could be doing. So does it really matter if the words are actually verbalized or thought? Is there a difference between the two? No, you need to correct the ones that are um, rattling around in your head first, <laughs> right? I love so it. I, I give this example in the book. The very beginning, when I started to say out loud that I was writing a book, my own mother said, really, what do you know about writing a book? And just the saying of that, put that doubt in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. So I could play on my personal podcast, I could play that over and over again, or mm -hmm. I could choose not to play that. And I, I'm a fan of uh, replace it. So mm -hmm. it's not as easy to just say, I won't listen to that anymore. I won't allow that to be in my head anymore. It's easier, I believe, it's been my experience that it's easier to replace it with something. So every time the trigger of doubt happens, I have the replacement of, I am capable of doing this. I do mm. have, 
the expertise. And I put those words of certainty um, in place of the words of doubt. I love that. And, you know, I was uh, I'm very active on this app called Clubhouse. And, yes. you know, yes. there's been a number of different rooms that I have been in where I learned a lot of different things that I haven't learned before. And I just say yet at the end of the sentence. So, you know, if we say, you know, I don't know how to publish a book yet, simply adding <laughs> that gives us more That's power, right. you know, because, hey, as a mom of 15, I see a lot of things that I just have not experienced in a lot of yeah. places, you know, right. whether it's right. dental visits, you know, because everybody's different. So I love that reframing. Yeah. So what is it that you believe that we can do on a regular basis to just begin that journey of reframing or thinking about words, you know, do we just do new vocabulary words every day or what is it that you recommend to kind of help us grow in this area? Excellent question. And I've gotten it before. So now I've minimized it down to a sentence. Okay. So I'm okay. going to encourage your listeners to write this sentence down because it's a, it forms the um, you know, framework for all the words to, to flip out. And, and just in a sentence. So here's the sentence. I will when I want and I get that I can. And then you circle all the I's and because they're not needed and you cross mm -hmm. out the word that, that last word. So I will when I want and I get that I can. And now you're left with will, when, want, and get and can. Mm -hmm. So all of those words are your good replacement words. Those are the words that are more uplifting, more <clears throat> certain. And I'll walk through some of them or all of them if we have time. Mm -hmm. Let's start with will. So will, um, so often people say, uh, I might, or we probably will be able to do that. Even with kids, sometimes we yeah. say, you know, we're, we'll probably be able to do that um, later in the week. And that's offering them a sense of uncertainty. So mm. we will be able to do that. And maybe you're not certain. So oftentimes people say, well, I don't know. I'm, I am not certain. That's okay. Say I, we will, or I will commit to getting that done by the end of the week. And then if you're pushing up against the commitment and, and need to change it, then change it. But speak more in terms of certainty, particularly from a leadership perspective, mm. telling your team that we might meet our Q4 goals you know, where's, where does that leave you? Because <laughs> they can hear it and feel the uncertainty as well. So okay. offering will instead. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, I'm I'm taking notes so we can go right through them. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> when, when replaces the word if. I know you've heard so often, sometimes I even, I hear politicians say, well, if we're able to improve the infrastructure, and I think to myself, what do you mean if? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> when we improve the infrastructure. So you're assuming that this, and you're asserting that this thing will be done when you offer when. Love mm -hmm. that. That's good. All right. Want. Want replaces should. Um, mm -hmm. So, or ought to, or, you know, those types of things. And um, so I grew up in Maryland and people tell, ask me, have asked me many times how I got to California. And I've spent a lot of my adult life in California by way of 10 years in Montana, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. lots of moving. Anyway, I say I went to California because of the shoulds, because I felt on the East Coast a true sense of you should this and you should that, and they, mm. you know, a lot. There just were so many rules, and you know, Emily Post had something to do with that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just feel that um, stifling the shoulds became a really big part of my uh, identity when I was in my twenties and, you know, with your kids, the age kids that you have and such, I bet you, you feel that like kids yeah. bump up against what they feel they should do because somebody's using that word, mm -hmm. whereas put that aside and talk about what you want to do and what's important to you and, um, how doing of something aligns with your values, then you're in a better place. Love that. Yeah. That's good. Um, all right. And, and replaces, but so I'll tell you what, but you know this, but severs, it cuts and you're whatever. If you just said anything to me and I, I was listening and it, and the very first thing I said was, but 
this and that. I'm just like, what? just cut off what you just said, right? So true. Yeah. Whereas my, I had a choice to say, oh, I hear you. And we might have an opportunity to do this, or we will have an opportunity to do this. Right. Love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as an extender, it's an extender. It, it implies collaboration. Mm -hmm. It implies that I've listened well to what you have to say. And here's the deal. Sometimes we butt ourselves, right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. We do it. We say, I'm, I'm going to tell you about this important thing I've been working on, but we we had some obstacles. And so now all you're hearing is obstacles. The, you're mm -hmm. only hearing the butt part. And I've just diminished the value of the important thing I was about to tell you. So true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we say it, we say it in leadership positions. We say it as moms. We say it all the time. It's, you know, we're, it, it, and then it indicates that you're only half listening. You've only yes. half connected with the information. Yeah. So true. Yes. All right. All right. So we're going to say, and instead, and here's the deal. I had somebody say to me, what? However, you know, instead of but, I say however. However is still but fine. in a tuxedo, in a tuxedo. <laughs> so true, so true. That is so true. Yeah. All right, get was the next one. And so mm -hmm. this is like really kind of get to as opposed to have to. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I talk about the difference between, beside, um, between saying, um, I have to pick the kids up after school today implies a burden mm -hmm. right we have mm -hmm. to follow this policy and procedure as mm -hmm. opposed to we get to follow this procedure in order to keep our patients safe mm -hmm. or I to pick up the you know eric after soccer today and that's exciting to me so i'm not implying that it's a burden and you know we all know that's a really short-lived thing 18 years blink of an eye <laughs> right? so true yeah. right yeah so Flipping it to 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 eliminate the sense of a burden and feel the gratitude of the doing of the thing. Love that. And you know, one of the things is the energy is different. So, like, you know, okay. if you close it off, so to speak, about you have to do something, you know, it just eliminates the ability to kind of dream or uh, come up with a creative thing that you could do when you pick them up. You know even like opportunities to network, you know, if you're like, I have to do this, but if you, I get to, there's moms there that I can, you know, collaborate. I mean, it just is a different energy. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually had somebody say to me yesterday, I have to attend this, when you said the word networking reminded me, I have to attend this networking thing tonight. And I, that, you know, when I hear somebody say have to, that this is my burden now is that I'm so sensitive to these words. I think to myself, okay, well, if you feel like you have to, then why are you going, right? right. You, you, get to, you get to show up and connect with other people. And mm -hmm. when you change it in your head, you know, we're back to that personal podcast first, when you change the narrative, then you lean into it from a different perspective. So true. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, the last one is Ken. So this is pretty simple. It's, it's the difference between can and can't. And so for mm -hmm. as long as you believe and you, your narrative says that you can't do something, you can't mm -hmm. publish a book or what have you, mm -hmm. that will be tr true, right? For as mm -hmm. long as you say and believe that you can't, you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. It'll be true. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you change that up and you commit to to saying in your mind, your personal narrative, as well as saying out loud to others that you can. And you said that you asked you, does it, does it need to be uh, said out loud or does it um, mm -hmm. or internally at the very beginning? Here's the thing. When you want to make a commitment, when you really want like to write a book or what have you, putting it out in the universe has importance. Like you start mm -hmm. to lean into it differently. So that's the value in in speaking something out loud, speaking your truth. I love that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you published this book during 2020. And for mm -hmm. a lot of people, that was a tough time. You know, that's when the actual pandemic was taking place. So what advice would you give people about um, just the challenges, you know, and ability to focus? Because I know I was 
doing a lot of master classes, helping a lot of women navigate working from home, their kids being at home in a virtual setting, you know, mm -hmm. but for some people, yes, the pandemic is looking different in different places, but there still is that uh, how do you focus? You know, your life is totally different than what you're expecting or whatever. So what advice would you give them? It's an excellent question. And I'm so glad you asked me that because I'm passionate about the process, right? Which I think mm -hmm. will help anybody interested in a book. So I, I believe we should all lean into our strengths at all times, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. one of my strengths is organization and kind of being real analytical about processes. So mm -hmm. sort of project managing things. So mm -hmm. that's what I did. So I did the research and I said, oh, here's my research set. I'm going to give you this in a nutshell. The average not um, nonfiction book is 210, 220 pages long. Mm -hmm. 210 to 220 pages long equals 55,000 words. It takes, um, you can write about 500 words and, and edit them and this and that in an hour. So I did all this math and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so if that's mm -hmm. the case, then I'm going to make incremental goals every week. I'm going to, mm -hmm. I think I started out saying I was going to write 10,000 words or something when I had the, you know, I took my calendar and said, here's the amount of time I have for writing. Therefore, how many words per week? Right. And I, I, plotted that out incrementally. And then I said, oh, I'm going to have 55,000 words by such and such date. Right. Love that. Yeah. I love okay. that. And I yeah. think, um, you know, because a lot of times people can't do what they want to do because they don't have a plan or it's not right. clear, you know, it's not actionable. You know, we could say we want to write a book, but okay, what are we doing to that? Are we going to you know, sit down every day for, you know, and write a page or, you know, what, what are, what's the work that's going to be done? So I love how you even breaking that down because sometimes people don't do it because it just seems so overwhelming. That's right. That's you know, right. to even get started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's Right. So I think that's key. And I'm sure that's key. So that's another one of those words. Oftentimes mm -hmm. when people say, I think I didn't need to just say, I think that's key. I know that's key to it. And I, that's another one of my words uh, that I bring up in the book about, particularly for leaders to say, I think, or I think probably, you know, so you're minimizing, 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 mm. time. be certain and say, I'm, I know that this will be um, the best approach. So I got on that because I chose, I think, I know that taking this whole big thing of writing a book and distilling it down into actionable items each week is what's going to get you there. I love that. Now, so talk to us about what you do in your daily routine, because to me, I feel anybody who wrote a book, I was fortunate to be a part of a book project during the pandemic, but being able to do that in spite of, you know, so many things were changing in our lives, in society, in the world, and being able to have that focus, you know, that to me is a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are some things that you do in your daily routine that helps you maintain this innovative, visionary type of uh, stance that you have with, you know, how you approach life? Well, thank you for that question. You lead me to something I'm incredibly passionate about. <laughs> so I'm really <laughs> passionate. I, so I'm a coach and I actually had a client call this morning right before this one. And I talked about this very thing. So imagine your week next week. And what mm -hmm. does the calendar look like? And so it's November, a new month. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Which is crazy. That's crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> no. But imagine your, your week next week and, and think about the things on that calendar that represent being proactive mm -hmm. as opposed to the spaces on the calendar that leave you open to being reactive. And so mm -hmm. you ask me, what do I do? I have, and I actually have this funny uh, blank template that I share sometimes when I'm doing the coaching or, or team coaching or what have you. So my blank template says, and it's true, I show it as a blank template, but it's the foundation of my calendar says that I meditate slash pray first mm -hmm. thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. I do yoga. I have a time, I think it's at, um, just at, uh, right up against lunch. So it's, it's easier to commit to something if it bumps up against something else. Mm -hmm. So I have a, 10 minutes of breath work 
after mm -hmm. lunch before that settles me into the knowing of what I'm going to do next. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I have it at three 30 in the afternoon. I have a quiet time. Sometimes it involves stretching and such. And then if I haven't done yoga or done a walk or whatever, it might um, involve that. So this, what I'm telling you is this is like the foundation. This is like mm. well-being for Terry. And those are the, this is the beauty of it. I'm trying to write a book, there needs to be the space for the creativity and for the thoughts. So in meditation, seriously, straight up, I'd be meditating during the writing of the book. And I would think, you know, I would think to myself, okay, what is my intention? My intention for today is to find somebody who aligns with a story about families and how words trigger a family, right? Mm. So I set that intention and I'm going to go into my peaceful place. And, you know, I might afterwards have say, said a prayer about that. I kid you not, that night at my yoga class, the yoga instructor said, hey, if you all don't mind, I'd like to share a story of um, how I was triggered with my family with some words that were said over the holidays. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to her afterwards and I was just like, huh, can you tell me more? And she's in the book. Hey Amen. That's awesome. You know, and you, you brought up a great, great word that I think a lot of people talk about. They uh, dance around, which is intention. Yes. So what was life like for you before intention stepped in and what, what happened to make that so? That's a good, um, so here's how I like to think about it. I feel like intention was seeping in <laughs> for a really long time. And it was, you know, it was um, more, I was sub subverting or whatever the word is, um, yeah. the, the intention. And then things were happening and things were manifesting in my life that I had a, like a tiny thought about. And then I started to connect the dots about how that worked. I went, whoa, whoa, mm -hmm. wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I can have I can set these intentions more intentionally. And mm -hmm. I began doing that. But to be honest, I was doing that in my 20s. It's just that mm. I've refined it now. And then, you know, by the time you get to your 50s, it's appropriate <laughs> that you start to refine your efforts, which I did. Mm. In the book, I use that word intention a lot. And here's why. I believe when we're speaking that, you know, I gave you a handful of words. There are many, many more in the book. The point is that there's what's in our heart and there's what's in our head. And mm -hmm. there's oftentimes a misalignment when it comes out of our mouth. Right. Sometimes what comes out is all about what's in our head and mm -hmm. it doesn't connect to our heart. And so mm -hmm. what I say about that is before it comes out of your mouth in that nanosecond, what do you intend for this message? What do you intend to impart to the other person? How do you intend to represent your own values, your, your own voice? <laughs> so it's important to consider that intention in that nanosecond between your heart and your head when you're speaking. Mm, that is so good because, you know, we have this term or belief or philosophy that the more you slow down, the faster you can go. So mm -hmm. I love that for me, that image comes up with slowing down before you speak, you know, and uh, you can just minimize any discord and you can really be focused on what it is that you want to achieve. So I love that. And I think, you know, I was trying to explain this to my kids that, you know, the real work is creating the world that you want from what you speak. That's you know, right. it's easy to go around and I just can only speak from my own experience that it's easy to live mindlessly, to just do what everybody else is doing, be on autopilot, but it takes the work to intentionally design your day, design your week, design your business, all these other things. So I love mm -hmm. that you shared that. That's amazing. So you just unknowingly <laughs> stated the quote, the first quote in the book, it's by Tom Kenyon. Uh -huh. um, it says, we are, we are creating the world by how we speak to each other. Love you that. that. You just mm -hmm. said that yeah, mm -hmm. without even knowing that that's, and yes. Yeah. I love that because I mean, I believe it's so true. You know, we, uh, whatever you focus on grows, you know, okay. so uh, I, and just a quick story. So 
every Christmas, you know, we have our kids, you know, we exchange gifts mm -hmm. and they always, mm -hmm. all ages want to give us things as parents and my mom, uh, you know, my dad has passed away, but we would always get these stuffed animals. You know, mm -hmm. that was the easiest thing for them to buy. And so we had tons of them. And so I'm like, oh, thank you so much. So sweet. My mom said, look, I appreciate the thought, but I'm sick of these stuffed animals. Okay. <laughs> she said, you can get me something else because I am not collecting them. And ever since she said that, you know, we've gotten better gifts. And it's like, I didn't think to tell them. I'm just like, oh, it's a thought that counts. But I say that because the more we were just saying, oh, this is so nice. They kept getting us more stuffed animals, yeah, you know, but the minute hearing. we spoke up yeah. and said, hey, something different, that's when things change. So what are we saying in our own life that even though it may not be what we want, but we're speaking about it or we are agreeing with it instead of stopping it and doing something different. So yeah, it's yeah. true. You know, it's so funny when you were saying that I was thinking about when, when my kids are really little, they're in their twenties now, mm -hmm. you know, when kids act up or something with so often parents will say, use your words, use your words. And mm -hmm. I feel like saying that to adults sometimes, and I don't want to say just use your words. I want to say pause for a moment and contemplate them and then use your words. <laughs> yeah. So true. And you know, we're the example. That's the thing, you know, okay. we, um, you know, kids are going to do what we say and, you know, there's so many different ways that, you know, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to discourage them about gift giving or whatever. And, you know, they're like, hey, they're getting me all these stuffed animals because they're thinking that's what I love. That's right. <laughs> so it's making it easy for them. You know, instead of just saying, I love that you thought of me, I would love to see how else you can think of me or something. It doesn't right. have to be negative. I think that's another thing. That's right. Anytime we feel we have to tell someone something, we portray or have this, you know, foreboding that it has to be some negative occurrence. That's right. And it's mm -hmm. so easy to reframe it to the positive. You know what I would really love? Or, you know, what yes. would... You know, or you might even leave it at what I would love the most. We, you know, we have so many um, bears and or um, stuffed animals, which is fabulous. What would be most important to me is to re receive something that you'd like me to have or something along those yes. lines, you know, where you turn it around to um, back to them. So I love that story. So true. Well, mm -hmm. this has been an amazing conversation. So tell everybody how they get a hold of you, your book, what's the name mm -hmm. of it so we can get a copy. I'll show it. So that's the book, mm -hmm. um, The Words We Choose, Your Guide to How and Why Words Matter. And it's it's on Amazon and um, Goodreads or, you know, all of the um, good books. I think it's called all of the um, online places. And mm -hmm. you can get a hold of me at Terry, which is spelled differently, T-E-R-R-E -R -R -E, at thrivinglc.com, which stands for Thriving Leader Collaborative. That's, a, that's mm -hmm. my business We'd love to connect. We're on a mission to um, ignite the joy of leadership and leaders worldwide. So I'd love to connect. We do love workshop. that. Yeah. Things like awesome. that. Awesome. And then what final words would you love to share with uh, the audience today? Well, I, I believe that as Tom Kenyon said, we're creating the world, the world by how we speak to each other. And so what I would add to that is, Yours is the voice of humankind. Mm. So, so use it well. Love that. That is awesome. Well, we want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments, but reach out, have a conversation. I am so inspired by simply taking a few minutes out of my day to connect with Terry and just, you know, I've got a page full of notes, y'all. Uh, mm -hmm. some ways that I can replace some language so that it works better for me, that I can do better on my journey. So thank you again so much for uh, that insight, Terry. My pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Well, you guys have an amazing day and we will see you all on the next episode. Bye for now.